Welcome to Brain Power with Dr. Echo, where each week we discuss how your family can boost brain health by addressing mind, body, emotional, and environmental health. And now here's the episode. Hello, friends and families. Welcome to another episode of Brain Power with Dr. Echo. It's such a pleasure to be here with you today. I have an amazing guest. He is no other than Mr. Jamiel Owens. He interviewed me on his show, The Awesome Dad, and I had such a good time. I had to bring him on here so that he could share your, his awesomeness with all of you. So welcome to the show, Mr. Owens. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate being here. And, you know, w we were just talking beforehand. I might be the first father that you have on this podcast. So it's definitely a pleasure to be in this space and represent dads for the first one, because there will be plenty more. Hopefully we won't speak yeah. into existence, but I appreciate it. And yes, you were a guest on the show, the awesome show, and it was amazing to connect with you. And I'm excited about this, this relationship that we'll build, this friendship and supporting you any way possible. Yes, and same here, too. So tell the listeners more about you, please. So if you have not known already, I am a autism father. My son Shane is 16 years old. You see the flag? Oh, there you go. And back of me, so I'm a volunteer firefighter here in Hatfield, PA. That's where I live at currently right now. About an hour outside of Philadelphia. I was born in Houston, Texas, raised in North Philadelphia, lived in Philadelphia all my life and decided to just move on out to the county now to get some slow, slow living and some bunnies and stuff like that, you know, just a little bit of green grass and everything. But I've been um, advocating in this space for autism fathers since 2014 with the start of my podcast, which was an awesome show, and then later transformed into a online radio show and then an online uh, television show, and now is back on online radio at wizradio.com, which is a online radio station, Christian music, Christian hip hop music based out of North, uh, New Jersey, excuse me, uh, shout out to DJ Wiz. So that's a little bit about me also too. I am the family relations coordinator at the Center for Autism Research at CHOP and, and really just love everything that I did. So that's me in a nutshell. Wonderful. Wow. So it's actually a radio show. I had no idea. I thought it was just an IG show. Good to know. Yeah, it's, it's both. So I like to do the IG because a lot of people aren't in the, in the mindset to listen to podcasts. A lot of people are, but I like like people to see who we are talking about for the most part. And I know okay. um, a lot of podcast platforms are allowing um, the visual aspect as well, too. So once I kind of make more time, I'm able to kind of sit down and actually do that. But right now I'm busy. And the reason why I'm busy, because it's like boots on the ground doing stuff 100%. And isn't that what life is about, right? We need to live out our purpose. So that's wonderful. I'm trying. So let's talk some more about advocating for dads in the autism space. And the reason I was, I came on your show is because I was like, whoa, a dad, finally. Because at, as a pediatrician, I see so many moms, right? And it's mm -hmm. rare the dads I see. So I really, I really applaud you for what you're doing. But please tell our listeners more about what you do and how you encourage dads to be more involved. So it, and I get that all the time. And I guess that's kind of like my, my niche. That's the reason why I've been so uh, well received in this community because there hasn't been a lot of dads. But then again, there has. I know two dads. But the thing with them is that, and it's no disrespect, once again, people see they're actually doctors. So people see them as their profession and not so much as an actual father. So there are dads in this space, but I will also advocate to say that there's not enough. And, and I get a lot of great rave and reviews and, and honor because I'm doing this type of work. And it, it goes a little bit, if I, if I sat down and kind of like, really opened up to how my life was back then to where I'm at now, you'll be like, how and why? Because it, it, it didn't make sense. So I, I'll give you a, a little brief synopsis of my life. I've been on my own since 16. I was actually uh, kicked out of my house by my mom. She suffered from schizophrenia and depression. So the streets basically raised me. I had to figure out what life was as a young man at 16 and kind of continue to go. 
I never finished high school, which is like one of my biggest regrets. I went to one of the best high schools that still is one of the best high schools in Philadelphia, Central High School. And the reason why I didn't graduate is because just like a lot of black men, we don't open up and tell what's going on with us. And, and, and I want to take it from the black and brown community, but I want to take it for all men. We don't open up that much and talk about our feelings. So I internalized everything and that halted a lot of my educational possibilities. I didn't do work and everything like that, obviously. And then I got kicked out and I went to a school that was quote unquote a neighborhood school, according to addresses, previous address. And I was like, this is not for me anymore. So I got my GED and just started working. And when I mean working, I, I was holding like two, three, four jobs at one time because my mindset was to not be poor, but I ended up for a lot of years being poor in spirit and in integrity and rich in, in financially, financially risk. But all of those was poor because once again, the streets raised me. So fast forward to now, you look at everything that I have been blessed to be able to do, being able to still be alive and not in prison and, and not, you know, you know, in so many other things that normally African-American male, black men have been in historically, you know, I'm blessed to be able to love on everybody, no matter what their skin color is, religion. That's really an eye opener for me and a blessing. It gives me life every single day. So I'm living a dream. Something that you said is so important. You said you were rich in finances, but poor in everything else. Can you talk about that a little more? Because I think that's an important mindset for people to realize and that there has to be balance all around. And it, it is. And until you get to a, a, a good place in that journey, you will never be able to do what I did was to actually say it or talk about it. You will be more so like, oh, well, that's not me. That's you. You'll be more uh, defensive in that nature. So I never had a, you know, just like every, every other child, I grew up in church. You know, when we say that we grew up in church, our grandparents took us to church, even though we didn't want to be there. I remember vaguely. I went to Bible school and I remember I had to actually memorize a whole chapter, was it, in, in, for a particular, particular book in the Bible. And I, I memorized the entire thing. I memorized this to the point where when I was actually reciting it, the entire church stood up in ovation. That's how, that's how I remember that. And then when my great grandmother passed, who took me away, I just totally forgot it because it was associated with her. So as most of us do, majority of us do, I, I just lived off the world and I was really, really about me. So using people for what I can use them for, just trying to get ahead of everybody else. Um, not there for my son at the young age. I missed three or four years of his life because of the diagnosis. And I'm like, no, I'm going to just do me and figure it out and, and things like that. So I, I really had to come into a focus of, of spirituality and what that was for me. And it, it helped me to understand the beauty in my son and why God gave me this gift for my life. Cause my life was trash, like was going out the wrong path. And in, in my belief, and I don't want to impose my beliefs on anybody else, but my belief is that God gave me this child to impose my actual purpose on this planet. Cause he knew I was going to squander that away. You know, I, I want to always wanted to be a police officer in public service, hence, you know, the firefighter and, and, and God was like, I'm going to use you as a public servant, but you're going to be a public servant for those just like your son. And you're going to find more, you know, more fulfillment and enrichment and loving in others and pouring out and pouring yourself empty. And your, your, your cup is going to be refilled from the love that they receive and give back to you and what I do for you. So it's important. It's important, vitally important. And, and I'm not here to, to make case on what religion you should practice, but find a spiritual grounding because that is the only thing that's going to make you accountable and a better person for every single body, not just your family, not just your community, for everybody on this planet. And we need that um, nowadays. Yes, we need that. And you're absolutely right. Yes, I believe God puts us here for a purpose and he wants to use us and in whatever it is we find our hands to do. And with you, you found your purpose in helping other dads 
love on their kids and be there for their kids. So you also mentioned something earlier about when you first had the diagnosis for your son, you missed three or four years of life. And I feel like a lot of dads bring the child that they were expect. I mean, it's not just dads, moms, but since you're a dad, we're going to talk about other dads, right? So can you talk to dads about that process of how can they walk through that grieving process to accept the child and see their children as gifts? I, I definitely can. The first, the first part I want to say for the father specifically, man up. This is not about you. So when I'm talking to my dads, because this was a hard pill I had to swallow, you have to understand the moment you have child, the moment of conception in that woman, in your wife, in your partner, whatever the case may be, it is no longer about you. Often as fathers, as men, we immediately spring into action to provide, but then we get barreled backwards when we're like, but what about me? It's not about you. You have to man up. You have to educate yourself. You have to lean on your partner if that's possible. If that's not possible, if you guys are not together, you must lean on a community of other, other dads. If there is, if you're, you know, other moms, other families that are actually going through this journey, that's for the dad. For the moms, you have to be sympathetic to understand that the language that you speak as a woman does not correlate the language that's understood as a man. We desire to fix things. And when we receive this diagnosis, and I'm speaking from my own personal thing, we are given a certificate that says, hey, guess what? You can't fix this. That is a strike on our ego and pride. So though moms, we are internalizing that because we are the strength or trying to be the strength of the family. The communication on what you actually need at that moment must be at layman's terms. Hey, babe, honey, I need a hug. Because at that moment, we're trying to process why we can't fix it, how we could go around that and fix it. And then the last thing, unfortunately, and we apologize, is you and your feelings. It's all about us when we receive that diagnosis. So do a favor by just simply explaining what you need. And sometimes, you know, as, as, as couples, as, as men and women, married couples, we're like, well, I shouldn't have to explain my partnership, Manomi. We're not mind readers. You're not mind readers. So the same thing, fathers, you must in layman's terms, explain to your partner, your wife, Hey, babe, I'm having a hard time internalizing this. Can you help educate me like you're educated on what autism spectrum disorder looks like? What are some things that our child is doing characteristics that are highlighted in this particular uh, piece of document? It's about communication and it's going to be tested even more after the diagnosis. That was so, oh my goodness, that was so true. We each think each other is a mind reader, and it's really about empathy and communication, right? Each person looking out for the best of the other person saying, I know this is hard. I know it's hard to hear, but I'm here for you, right? And just stating what we need. And yes, I hear you. I always tell my mom is, I tell the dads what you need. They have no idea because we women are like, you should know. But some, some of our, us men are like, yeah, you should know. And it's not fair. It's not fair generalized to people. I got a mind reader. Like you, you have to know. So let's take a perfect example. Let's take a perfect example. And I'm going to use this because I do a lot of advocacy work in law enforcement and, and neurodiversity. A police officer pulls you over. You're a young woman with autism. He comes up to the car and he's looking at you and you're, all over the place, obviously, because now your, your anxiety has heightened. Now it's like a sensory overload. And he's immediately thinking just off of perception. He or she is like, okay, we possibly have someone that's on drugs or intoxicated. Where though, you're a person that is on the autism spectrum. Now, here's the thing. If you don't communicate that with the officer, and sometimes a lot of people as autistics, autistics themselves, they're like, well, I don't want to give my diagnosis. Well, when you don't give your diagnosis on who you are, you don't advocate for yourself and you do not hold the other party accountable now of the information 
that you have given them. So it is important to say, hey, just want to let you know, officer, I'm on the autism spectrum, so please be patient with me. Hey, you're not saying, hey, I'm on the autism spectrum. I live here. My blood type is this. This is my social security number. You're not giving all that information. You're just letting the officer know at that time on how he should handle the situation. You put the onus on him. So that's that's communication. That's letting them know. We have to do that when it comes down to 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 raising this child, to understanding the diagnosis together, whether you're together or not. We have to do that. And even for doctors to release that information to, to patients, get away with the jargon. Hey, listen, I want to talk to you, mom and dad. Do you know anything about autism spectrum disorder? No. Let me talk to you about what exactly that is and why I'm telling you this. And now break it down. You know what you just did? You just became their friend, their ally. Now you're educating them instead of telling them, hey, this is what it is. Good luck. You know? So yeah, I, I, you just got me on a rant. I was thinking about it. I'm like, oh, let me put my little two gems in here real quick. I just, I just got a really important line from what you said that parents should teach their children. It's like, just say, I, am on the, I have autism and please be patient. That's it. That's all. That's well, all the deal. children can say that to their friends at school. The children can say that to the teachers so that they like, okay, come down here because you know, there's 25 kids in the class and there's like all of this going on and this child may be having sensory overload and doesn't know how to handle it. It's, it's, okay, it's you parents it's, can tell your, can tell your teachers that too, right? It's, it's interesting because child. in a society, we won't disclaim that but we'll disclaim our identity our pronouns we'll disclaim that immediately but when it comes down to neurodiversity we hold back and why is that that is a part of you so when you when you say hey i'm an autistic or i have autism you're letting me know who you are we are instantly thinking oh well they're going to devalue me as a person and that's not true so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to really, really work within the black and brown community. And I get it. We have been marginalized by so many things. It's just like, I don't want my child to go through it. But I'm telling you as a, a father of a 16 year old, who's up on the cusp of understanding in this world or trying to, I am trying to prevent my son from being in prison or being dead because of the lack of pronunciation on who he is as a person. My name is Shane. I am a young man, a black young man who happens to have autism. This is how I work. Please be patient and kind. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with it. That is so empowering because it's, it's his idea. I mean, it's part of him. It's not something that's removed, right? And it's nothing to be ashamed of, like you said, definitely. And that's why we're doing what we do. It's like, there is no, all of those barriers and all of those labels, it doesn't define your child. Your child is your precious child. It doesn't define your child. It just, we just need your child to be protected. And so if it means that's what we say, that's what we say. So that we can get the best treatment. And you're absolutely right. Because now the onus is on the other person. Now they know they can't claim that, oh, you were just disrupted. Well, we told you. Yeah. Yeah, we told you. We gave you, we gave you a disclaimer. We let you know how we are, and then you, you didn't internalize that. You didn't think about that, and now you're coming back saying, "Oh, well, you know, you're put trying to put the onus on us." But it's no. We gave you what we are. We gave you that information in advance for you to dissect that, to unpack that, to say, "Okay, how am I going to address this individual differently?" Not differently in a form of putting them in a corner, but how am I going to make sure we're talking about education now as a teacher. So let's, let's, let's make sure people are following us. How am I going to educate this person about this neurotypical life in a way that they will understand how they stand in it, empower them to continue to stand in it and to build and to move forward. We're not equipping, and I'm going to put this little tidbit out there for all the teachers and the educational powers that be, we're not equipping the system, the teachers enough to understand neurodiversity. 
We are basing our education system on a old model from the 1800s. If you look at the first special needs school that was actually established in the United States, that was in the 1800s. Now, obviously, we have mended. We have added so many different programs. I'm not knocking down the educational system, but I will say this. You can track me down. The education system is not built for neurodiversity. There is no part in the educational system that is built for neurodiversity. So what would we like, or I can speak as an autism parent, is we need to come together, autism parents, stop pointing a finger, let's come together and work with these educational leaders, these administrative staff, and build up the school district to include our children for the generations to come. Because as of right now, there's no, there's no cure, you know, a progression of getting rid of autism, nor should there be. That is a person that you're talking about. So we have to use proper language, language that is not ableistic, language that's going to empower autistics. We are knowing that this will be something where we will have future generations of autistic individuals. So why are we not rebuilding the education system to make sure that we are including these people? I don't understand that. And I want to make sure I respect people. It, I respect educators. I respect the administrative staff. I respect the superintendents. What I don't respect is the lack of building and connecting in order to make something happen that's going to enrich not only now, but later on down the line. I'm a, I'm a, since I've been in this space, I have really been a man of action. I, I, I talk it, but I also, if you came to me, if a superintendent called me off this interview and was like, hey, I've seen, I seen your interview. I want to talk to you about doing some stuff. I'm rolling up my sleeves instantly and saying, let's get to work. Let's make it happen. Let's do some things. No, no. I mean, what you said is, is true because, I mean, it's the same thing with the, in the medical field. We all, we all need to come together to continuously build and not just stay where we used to be. And continuously learn as we are learning more and more in research, we need to put that into practice and make that practical for the child, right? Yeah. Now it's like, what, what's the rates? One in 36 kids. So you yeah. definitely have to do some work to, to boost the school system to be able to cater for these kids. And I like what you said, teaching them in, I mean, about the neurotypical life where they are, right? And they're, they're not neurotypical, but that's the world around them. So how do we prepare them to be the best version of themselves in a vastly neurotypical world? So, yes, you're absolutely right. Lots of work to do. Yes. We have to keep thinking about this for sure. And, and I like that you, we, we're taking action where possible. And so for all the teachers and educators listening, please reach out to Mr. Owens. It will be amazing to come to your school and help you guys with practical strategies to move forward. So well, let's do work we'll for you. Yes. <laughs> and I, you can call me too. We, me and him can go together. That's fine. But please call him. Let's get it done. Yes. yes, for sure. So what would you say to dads about how can they build up their sons as they're growing up and their daughters, their kids? to understand who they are and to see themselves as able, to see themselves as valuable. What does that look like? So it, and I revert this to, to religion because, you know, in a Bible, in a text, it tells you to, to die to oneself. Right. So I had to die to who Jamil Owens was in the world to understand, to become Jamil Owens in the kingdom's light and how everybody else will receive me. So I had to die to myself. And I, I tell you, I'm going to give you a story because I counsel a lot of autism fathers. I'm always getting called. I, that's what I love to do. They can always call me and, and we can kind of talk and unpack things. But this dad out of New York, he reached out to me and he's like, Jamel, it's raining over here and my son will not get out of the rain. He's just standing outside in the rain, looking up and he's playing and he's, he's just, he's just, in the rain and I need him to come in and I can't do it. And I asked him and I said, well, why aren't you out there in the rain? And he said, cause it's raining. And I said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go outside in the rain. I don't care if you get dirty, put on some clothes that you can, you don't really care about. Sit down in the rain, lay down in the rain, 
but lay down in a rain and immerse yourself into his world for one moment. Understand him. That connection is not going to be verbal. It's going to be visual and it's going to be physical. And these are the things that are going to break you down in order to establish a connection with your child deeper than anything else. So he did it. I thought he wasn't going to do it, but he did it. He called me back and he's like, that was amazing. Like I, I saw for one moment, it wasn't about car payments. It wasn't about bills. It wasn't about the stressors of the world, this divorce I'm going through. It was really just about me and my son. And I understood what he saw and I enjoyed it and I rejoiced in it. So I, I tell that story for parents because we have a lot of stressors, but it has to be that one moment or a couple moments in life where you disconnect from this world and you enter in their world and you sit in it and you just observe how they see the world. And when I tell you, it'll give you an instant recharge, it will instantly recharge who you are as a person. That's, that's, that's my advice. Remove yourself from this world, change yourself, brand new me, right? So we see that on Instagram all the time. I'm reintroducing myself, reintroduce yourself with an empathetic, compassionate version of yourself. The only way you're going to do that is by taking yourself and connecting with your child directly and just being in that moment. And then you'll, you'll attack this world and see it in a different way. So powerful. Oh my goodness. Wow. It's the, I've had, I had one of those moments too in Puerto Rico with my son. And I can tell you, I wrote about it in this, this book I co-authored called Superheroes on the Spectrum. Me and 33 other authors are in that book. And I wrote about my particular time with him and the rest of the family in Puerto Rico and, and how we we just connected me and him. And it, you know what it was? It was me holding them up in the water and spinning around. And for that moment, Philly didn't matter. In that moment, nothing else mattered. But seeing him trust me and connecting in a part of who he is, because he's, he's, he's half Hispanic. So connecting in his culture and seeing him relax and be one with nature. And that was the moment where I was like, Oh my God, like this is, this is the recharge I needed. So yeah, I walk the walk. I talk the talk. It's not just all fun and gay. I'm telling you guys, I'm letting you know. And that's true wealth. That's part of the wealth you're talking about, right? Because that is priceless. So it sounds like we parents need to do better about being intentional, about being present with our kids. It doesn't take hours. Let's put it down on our phones and actually look at these kids in the eye. If you're a divorcee and you know, you get your child on the weekends, like I do, you know, I do this every time I pick up Shane, I ask him, so tell me about your two weeks that I haven't seen you. And he runs down everything that it is with two weeks. And I listen to him and I ask him questions and that's, that's the rundown. But then also too, I create that social story about what we're doing for the weekend. So I give him a structure of what to actually anticipate for the weekend. And, and now that's a building block to our weekend. So now we started it off right. But I also let you know too, that there are some times where uh, uh, me and Shane are out in public. If, if he's just riding around it, sometimes he might just grab for my hand to hold it. And while as men, we'll sit there and be like, I'm not doing that. that, that no, that's not what you do. That looks a little suspect, but is it really, or is it really a communication that your son is trying or your daughter is trying to relate to you. Maybe they need you in that point and they're having a sensory overload for us. So for some reason, maybe it's that you, we got to take away these stigmas and that pride. So I hold his hand. I don't care. And are locked in everything to let him know that I'm here for him. And I, I'm that regulator. If he needs me to be the regulator, I'm going to be the regulator. And when he gets done, then we'll un, un, unhinge hands and, and then we'll continue on with what that looks like as far as our relationship. Oh, my goodness. And I mean, that goes for mom, that goes for dad. Yeah. yeah you're so right. All the stigma that you can hold hands. Like, really? What? Yeah, like, okay. There are kids. We gave birth to that one. Oh, I, okay. I, if you, if you think so, well, he's a grown man. So what? So what? What happens when, when we get close to death, unfortunately, what do you want to do? What's the first thing that you want to do? Do you want to hold another grown person's hand? So the, the moment of that transition is saying it's okay. 
is going to be okay. You're giving them a confirmation that everything is going to be okay. So why wouldn't I do that now? Why wouldn't you do that now? I don't care if he's 16. I don't care if he's 21. If he wants to hold my hand in public, I'm going to hold his hand. Doesn't mean anything. It just means that I, I killed my, my, my pride and my ego for my child. That's what that means. And that is the definition of love. It is. Yep. Pure love. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. We could just go on and on. This has been so amazing. I, mean, I know. I know. This is, this is a great conversation. I think a lot of interviews are, are kind of structured on, on the surface level stuff and they are not really hitting the deep points that is needed to be heard. And a lot of times too, it has to deal with the guests because they're not trying to be as transparent as possible. And that's okay. Transparency comes in different forms and different times in people's lives. I've had a rough life in order to keep my sanity and to, to try to build and be a better person. It is the best interest of me to actually be open and be transparent and to speak life into other people, or I could, you know, end up psychosis myself and I don't want to do that. So. Yes. I mean, there is no way to heal unless you open up, you think about the wound, right? We open, yeah. we'll open it up so that all the poison can come out. I mean, there's no way to heal our mind unless we let whatever is in there out so that we can now put new things in there, right? And new experiences and all of that. So you're absolutely right. And what's your take on therapy? Do it. I'm in therapy right now. Though I, I advise other men and sometimes women in family units, I'm in therapy too because I have a lot of past traumas that I've worked through or I'm currently working through from things that affected me long before. Like I said, everybody has a story. I have a crazy story. I shouldn't be here right now. And, and while doing this helps me also too, I need to speak to somebody because I do know that there are some other things that I internalize that I don't need to. And, and for everybody listening right now, you're not perfect. You're not perfect, but I love you the way you are. And you should be heard and you should be valued. And the only way that you're going to be heard and valued is if you get things off of your chest. And sometimes that's not coming off as, as cocky or vain. Sometimes that needs to be in an intimate setting with you and a provider. But also remember this too, is that provider is not perfect as well too. They're only limiting and giving you advice from what they personally know or what they have uh, been educated on. So as long as you know that transaction and, and how to take that transaction and value that transaction, you will understand, you know, it comes with a, a complete level of competence that will give you confidence in who you are and start to build you for your passion and your purpose. Yes. Thank you. I, yes. Everybody should be in therapy. Me too. So I absolutely think you're right. And I like that you said they're also human and they're not perfect either. But yes, it's important to get the things off your chest and even for your children to normalize it. And that's how I get my teenagers that I see to go to therapy. I'm like, do I look crazy? No. Okay. I'm in therapy. So you it will help you too. And then they're more likely to do it. But yes, especially, I've, I mean, I've heard, I'm not a man, but I've heard that or I've seen that men often struggle with the thought of going to therapy, but I'm so glad you said it because it's not about the ego, it's not, doesn't make you less of a man. It actually enhances you and, and help heal and walk through the things so that you can show up as the man, like you said, for your family and for your children. So thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. I appreciate it. Shameless plug before, uh, before we get off. So this shirt right here, Autism 365, this is a actual space in a library started by a librarian who has a personal connection with the neurodiverse community. It's in Winfield, Pennsylvania, which is like City Line Avenue area. So I want to give a shout out to, to Mary and everybody there, her staff. And then my book, my book is on Amazon. Life is a puzzle guy gave you a cheat sheet. I have seven books. I didn't mention that. I even have a journal in there for fathers, acknowledgement and affirmation. So definitely a shameless plug. I want to put that out there, but also too, I know that you like to give a little tip for, for everyone out there. So for none of you have heard me do a presentation or a talk, I want to give you a piece of my favorite part of a talk. So this right here is a Lego piece, right? It's a white picket fence in American culture. We are told to work, to get the big house, beautiful car, beautiful family, the white picket fence, right? So two ways I want you to look at this while you're listening to me is one, 
as your loved one, the autistic individual themselves, their white peak offense is not going to look the same as yours, mom and dad. So if you ever heard of the term facilitated communicator, that is when one person actually supposedly helps individual who is on a autism spectrum or with intellectual disabilities communicate using an AAC pad. It's been debunked. It's been found that the person, the actual assistant has been the one that's communicating their thoughts, right? So are you a facilitated communicator in their life? Their house might be a one bedroom apartment with a service dog or a service cat working at Wendy's, but they're happy. That's their white picket fence. And then for you parents, your white picket fence is never going to look white. There's going to be pains missing. There's going to be scratches. There's going to be dirt. There's going to be a, a colored paint. It is not going to look white, but it's your picket fence. And the best thing about picket fences is that every now and then it can be taken down and it can be built back up. So I want to empower both autistic individuals to continue to build your white picket fence and know that you have a support system and your families are looking for the best white picket fence to fit who you are. And parents, I want you to understand that you are building your white picket fence and it doesn't have to look the same. Allow it to have some pains missing, allow it to have some drawings, some scratches, but you know what? At the end of the day, that's your property, that's your white picket fence that you can be proud of. So that's the tip that I'm leaving you with. Wow. All that. Oh my goodness. So please, fathers listening, go follow Mr. Owen. And where can they find you? They can find me. I'm on Instagram, Facebook. I need to get a little bit better on Facebook, but the handles are the awesome show, T-H-E-A-U-S-O-M-E-S-H-O-W. And then Awesomeness Incorporated, which is my nonprofit organization. And that is A-U-S-O-M-E-N-E-S-S-I-N-C. Both of those are on Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, you can find me. You, you can find me there. Send me a message. Look at some of my content. I'm on TikTok too. I'm trying to be everywhere is just too much. I don't have that much time, but I also do a lot of talks. I'm on LinkedIn as well, too, under Jamel Owens. Uh, you can follow me there as well, too. But yeah, I appreciate the follow, suggestions, comments. If you're an autistic individual, always educate me because I'm learning. I'm learning about you. I'm learning about my son. I'm learning about everybody to be able to give this information out. So wonderful. It was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, please share this with as many people as need to hear this in your community, in your life, at work, because we all can be better every day. We're all better every day by one Christmas, and you can love our kids every day better. That's, that's, that's the definition of love. And that's the definition of living life because everything else will follow, right? So thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for coming on here. I so appreciate it. And until the next episode, everybody take care.